Hello and welcome to Insights, everyone. I'm Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. Thank you for joining us. Uh, just a few more days and then it will be May 29. I mean, May 29 will be upon us and that would officially mark the one-year anniversary of President Bola Tunubu's administration. Well, this week on Insight, we will be reviewing uh, just how much progress the administration has made in critical national sectors. And our guest analyst would gauge whether or not the administration is on course or uh, may need to alter its plans in certain areas. We'd we'll also put in proper perspective the rationale for the World Day for Cultural Div Diversification for Dialogue and Development, essentially highlighting why cultural diversity matters. Elizabeth is built to take up another key national issue. Elizabeth? Of course, we will also be comparing Nigeria's inflation figures and now we'll be taking cues from the recently released figures by the National Bureau of Statistics. And then we hear that Nigeria's inflation rate has hit 33.20%. We will analyze implications on businesses, Nigerians, and the economy in general. Very well then, let's kickstart the program. Whatever the issues are, the National Assembly is constitutionally empowered to scrutinize. However complex or intricate. We have involved all the, uh, the, the academia, the members of the academia. We have involved the academies. Be it government policies or in fact any issue of public concern. Our job is to help you gain clarity and make sense of it all. This is not really healthy for our democracy. There's a lot of um, aggrievance in terms of who has been in power longest and who becomes the governor of the it's also in the quality of food being consumed. After all, perception is insight. And gaining understanding is also getting insight. Well, now we begin. From whichever angle you look at it, I mean, depending on who is looking and where you're looking at, I'm sure you'd agree with me that uh, one year in the life of a government is definitely worth appraising. Uh, maybe not necessarily enough to judge uh, that government entirely, but significant enough to know what direction it is headed and whether or not it has um, shifted the needle, uh, you know, maybe ever so slightly in the right direction. Well, uh, that is what we'll be doing here today. We will be appraising the current administration of President Bola Tunubu as it prepares to hits the one-year mark. Uh, my guest is um, Nia Kinsiju, development economist and public policy analyst. Uh, he joins us here to, you know, x-ray and review, you know, just how much has been achieved in the last one year. Uh, welcome to Insight. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me. Of course, we, we know my, my guest is a bit under the weather, so if you see him a bit, um, you know, laid back, uh, that's because he's, um, he's a bit under the weather. Uh, otherwise, it's usually his vibrant, you know, exciting <laughs> step, uh, self rather. But it's, it's, it's quite exciting to have you here and thank you so much for Thanks coming so on, much. on, on the so set much. in spite of a, your health. It's a privilege. Thanks so much. I, I, I figure congratulations are in order. Mo most families are easily excited, you know, when the one year birthday of their child or ward approaches. Do, do you sense that excitement here and now in Nigeria as we look forward to the president's one year in office? And if not, or why not, if not? <laughs> well, practically speaking, uh, in terms of uh, reflections of um, <clears throat> either the level of economic index, uh, social mystery index, uh, and all that, uh, uh, when you look at those figures, it may, they may seem depressing. Uh, but again, I, I think for any, uh, any nuanced observer, uh, you also realize that uh, these are results of uh, implementation of new policies and, and giving us uh, new policies directions. Uh, for some of us who had also been an understudy of the administration, uh, we feel excited because we know that uh, it's, uh, the light is not just at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> we can see the light you know, from the beginning of the tunnel because uh, we see a paradigm shift from what we have been doing. Uh, perhaps for the first time over the last 60 years, we'll be breaking away from our dependency on the bust and boom in the character of our economy. 
uh, we've always, uh, since the 1970s, for instance, when we discovered oil, uh, we've had this dependency uh, kind of economy where we have prosperity within the short period of uh, oil boom, and uh, we go into a, a depressing session when uh, there's a oil bust, you know. So, but now we are seeing an economy that is driven or, or will be driven by the market, which is the standard, uh, the, the, the standard uh, template for a developing economy as it were. Uh, we have seen this in a number of countries uh, that we are doing it at this time. For us, it's exciting. Uh, well, it's uh, the, the initial, the initial uh, impact may be, may be depressing, mm -hmm. but we believe that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, with the philosophy underlining most of the policies that uh, the government had introduced into the space, uh, we think that, I believe strongly, that uh, things would, of course, change for the very, very better. You know, honestly, even the president realizes, you know, that squeezing effect of some of the current um, reforms being put in place. He, he describes them, he describes them as painful, uh, yet necessary. I, I think I'd like to use some of his words here. And uh, these are words that, you know, I recall the president saying during his inaugural speech uh, on May 29 at there at the Eagle, Eagle Square, uh, where he said, that um, we have arrived as, at this sublime moment and that we need to march beyond the dimness of night into the open day of renewed national hope. I mean, uh, would you say we're headed in that direction considering that you've started already by, uh, you know, identifying this shift, you know, the, the changes? Would you say we're headed in that direction that the president talked about in the inaugural speech uh, with some of what, uh, also considering some of what has been playing out in you know, in multiple fronts, uh, what policies perhaps in some of these key sectors would you applaud and say, yes, uh, these are beginning to b bear uh, short-term fruits and, you know, Nigerians will perhaps begin to see the long-term gains and soon enough? Yeah, de definitely. Um, if you look at even the social aspect of, uh, uh, of redressing the economy, for instance, uh, perhaps for the first time we would have... Uh, a trigger and a growth pattern in, in consumer credits, uh, principally driven by the government. I, I think that is important because it's a culture. Mm. It's a culture that would provide well-being and comfort or facilitate well-being and comfort for the average Nigerian when it becomes fully matured, starting from the civil service, as it were. Then we also have the student uh, loan, uh, which would uh, come into effect, uh, I think, in the next one or two weeks. Yeah, uh, soon enough appropriately, you know, framework uh, in the context of law, you know, which, which, means, which means that it's, it's, it is institutionalized. So to that extent, uh, that again is, uh, is a, new, uh, a new introduction into, uh, into the space, into the Nigerian space. Um, then we, we are seeing some very ambitious, uh, some very, very ambitious uh, construction, you know, that are now ongoing. Uh, we have, we've heard about the Lagos uh, Calabar coastal, uh, coastal Road yes. uh, that is also inclusive of, uh, of the Lagos Calabar rail line. You also have uh, the very, very ambitious 1,000 kilometers Badagri Sokoto Road, you know, and there are a number of uh, interland roads to the, uh, the East West Road and all that. Uh, the Bini, the Boni Bodo, very, very strategic road to, you know, uh, it's to be completed, you know. So uh, I, I think we can see the direction, mm. you know, and we can now also have, uh, we, we, we have milestones to determine how far the, uh, the government is willing to go. And perhaps even more impressive is the fact that money may not be a problem any longer. Historically, and this is, any time we had the boom, uh, we feverishly go into, uh, into building construction uh, mm -hmm. frenzy, as it were. And, that, and then while the boon was ongoing, the boss would cut up on us, and all of a sudden, we will abandon those projects. It is a cyclical thing, so much that we have more than 5,000 federal governments who own projects that have been abandoned. But now, I think there's also a paradigm shift in that, because now 
there's a guarantee of revenue earnings. Uh, we have seen the returns that are being shared by FAC, you know, every month, the Federal Accounts Allocation uh, Committee. Uh, what, what they are sharing between, I mean, amongst the three tiers of government, the federal, state, and local government. Now, it tells, that tells us that whatever the federal government, even the state government, and the local government wants to do in terms of moderate, you know, uh, uh, moderate infrastructural facilities that they want to deliver, there will always be that fund, you know, to drive it as long as, as, long as they are doing that within uh, expectations, you know. So, um, we are not likely to start experiencing issues around abandoned projects. We are likely to also experience more completion of older abandoned projects, you know, and to a large extent, our capital harm, the capital harm of, uh, of our budget will mm. perform properly, I mean, will perform impressively. Um, perhaps for the first time again, in over 20 years, um, the administration had given us a return on capital, the capital side of our national budget, you know, for the first time it is higher than the recurrent harm. So which means that more Nigerians have access per capita, you know, to, uh, to uh, government facilities and perhaps government earnings. Because uh, when you have current, where, where you have higher recurrent expenditure, mm. it is only targeted or given out to a small number of people, percentage of the population in uh, civil service or public, public service as it were. But it is from the capital uh, budget that most of us Nigerians that are common, you know, average yes. Nigerians, that have access to what government is doing. And those are the things, is the uh, the infrastructural facilities that actually enable businesses, that actually enables conveniences, that enables well-being and all that. So uh, we, th those are the philosophy that underpins what the, go what the government is doing. True. And I think going forward, would, we would be able to return a positive uh, impression on what the government is doing. Okay, so n now we've talked about, or rather you've talked about the underlining philosophy and then what's been achieved. So far, I'd like for you to just break this down a bit further and then, um, you know, you double down on the economy, but uh, maybe down to the bottom and appraise how some of these economic policies or interventions that you've outlined by the federal government have impacted the informal economy, which, of course, forms the bedrock of um, sustenance of many Nigerians. And that sector, that structure is struggling to you know, to stay resilient. We, we have heard and seen some of these, you know, the remedial economic plans of government to, you know, to cushion the pains being felt, you know, by Nigerians, you know, arising from some of these, um, you know, these measures being put in place. But I, I, I guess my question to you is, are things really getting better for, say, the organizer along that expressway? You know, the one you pass sometimes and you see him pack a small machine by the road to, you know, increase the air or <laughs> on your, in, your, um, in your tire. That's middle-aged lady who grants tomatoes and pepper at the market. You know that boy, that young unemployed graduate, you know, who's also is selling bread along that Maraba uh, traffic every time. You know, I'm trying to just reference, you know, that's unregistered in former economy, which often stands as a beacon of hope for many Nigerians. Are they feeling, you know, at what point will they begin to feel some of these, the impact of some of these um, reforms being put in place? I, I think we can actually restructure that question. Okay. Because uh, we have more Nigerians counted in the informal structure I mean, in informal economy, because uh, we, we have challenges of uh, unemployment. Um, most people are engaged in informal activities because of, uh, uh, because of the fact that they don't have a, a formal uh, economic engagement. So uh, I, I think the, the focus should actually start from that. Um, even the, the Yalakara on the side, you know, the Mama Kose on the side, if uh, she's gainfully employed, may not likely be uh, on, the, uh, on the roadside. So perhaps that is where we should look at. And uh, I have also reviewed a number of projects being, uh, being implemented by the government, uh, one of which is the uh, renew 
hope cities. Um, what impresses me is the fact that uh, in the renewed hope cities, there is a tie-in of what percentage of uh, what percentage or number of uh, possible employments that will be generated. So, for instance, uh, across 13 states that are that are being implemented now, uh, you have about 3,500 units, you know, of True. different uh, of of different uh, housing. Uh, NIP uh, character, uh, you know, that would be delivered. And for each of those uh, estates in the, in the states that will be, uh, that they, they will be built, there are targets at least for each of those estates to, to have a, a creation of uh, direct and indirect jobs. You know? True. So uh, it's important for all these projects, the more the projects we have, yes. the better for the economy. And, and I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I, and you I have see more, 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 uh, more uh, employment being generated. That is one. That's one leg of it. Okay. The other leg is to also, to also say that there are some people that are not even employable. There are some people, even by age, you know, are outside the effective employment age. A 60, 65 year old woman selling kose or granite on the side and all that. Now there's also that recognition. Who depends of on that, that business for yes. sustenance? You there's know, a recognition. For the of a family as yeah, well. exactly. There's a recognition of that by the government to say, okay, can we do a grant, uh, you know, of, of a collective 50 billion naira and just share amongst uh, these people? want to create because for them it's value creation no matter the sum of money given out to this kind to this set of people it has been established that they are very very serious minded and they can be very very transparent with the way they manage their resources no matter how small mm. so uh, I, I think over the last uh, three four weeks thereabouts there have been a lot of activities around this uh, uh, 50 billion naira being shared amongst amongst this set of people, and to a large extent, we, the the theoretical uh, the, the underpinning of this uh, of uh, uh, elevating those in the former sector, it is also to enable or to facilitate a prosperous economy. Once you facilitate it, a prosperous economy, and that's so, some of the things we are talking about, the uh, credit system, uh, uh, construction, and all that. When more people have money in their pockets, they are also ready to buy, you know, from the roadsides and from the informal sector. And okay. that enhances the productive capacity of those in the informal sector. Uh, it may not, we may not have enough time to, you know, expansively... Uh, dwell on some of the interventions carried out by this administration in the amount of time we have here on, on the program. Uh, but like I somewhat inferred or insinuated at the commencement of our discourse that we would uh, do a cursory review of some of these um, you know, critical sectors. Uh, one area I would like for you to just touch on uh, is the issue of um, government's tax reforms and um, just how impact, impactful it has been uh, so far. I get that Nigeria undoubtedly uh, faces significant revenue challenges, which, of course, continues to constrain the country's capacity for achieving sustainable growth. But, I, I, of course, I reckon that um, that reinforces the rationale for government tax reforms, basically as mobilization for revenue. However, I, I need your insight into um, some concerns raised by, you know, some analysts over what they termed the unintended consequences of government tax reform policy. They argue that a country cannot tax itself to prosperity and that higher taxes do not lead to sustainable growth. I put that against the prevailing economic situation in the country and now the average Nigerian, you know, is perhaps struggling to keep his head, his or her head above water and rationalize the argument for appropriate taxing, multiple taxes and tax evasion and the need of course, for sensitivity on, you know, on the part of government on this whole issue. Recently, we saw the president demonstrate that on the cyber security levy. Uh, what are your thoughts on just how all of this can, can be fused and um, made to work? Uh, well, thank you. Well, I, I, I think there is a, also a need to understand the context of a, a tax administration in Nigeria. Um, to who are we talking to? That, that's a, that's the first thing. You, you, you've identified the informal sector, for instance. To a large extent, at least at the level of the federal government, the federal government has no business relationship with uh, the informal sector because 
the, uh, it is even not proposition. Uh, I think the Finance uh, Act 2019, thereabouts, clearly states that uh, any business, you know, that uh, any, any business that with a turnover of less than 25 million is exempted from uh, company income tax or uh, value added tax. So to a large extent, <laughs> I know that no informal sector participants, you know, uh, or business entrepreneurs, as it were, uh, will qualify for that. So okay. there, there, is, there cannot be any border. Now, there's also a serious effort uh, by the federal government to engage with the subnational, so that uh, subnationals, so that there, this idea of levies in the markets and, and all that would also uh, be controlled, will be managed, and that there will only be one channel of taxation, you know, and that uh, out of uh, the more than 100 and something uh, taxes that had been profiled across the country, that the taxes that will be paid by any Nigerian should not be more than three different tax taxes. So I, I, I think the, there's a lot of effort being made al along that line. And the, the important thing for us is to say that all middle, all low and middle income earners, except for those who are working, who would have to pay, you know, their payee, pay as you earn, uh, most people are not, uh, are not even qualified uh, for, for business class taxation. We seem to have run up our time for this episode, I mean, this segment of the program. I'd wanted us to, um, you know, talk about the target sets for MDAs by the administration and just how, you know, how the, of course, the tracking mechanism in place to monitor some of these deliverables, uh, you know, as a tool for, for transparency in corporate governance. And uh, unfortunately, I can't, I can't get your thoughts on that. And of course, there are other issues I would like for us to talk, talk about. We will be doing that in the course of our countdown to May 29, which officially marks the one-year anniversary of the current administration, we would um, be bringing you back. Hopefully, by then, you will be a lot stronger <laughs> and feeling up to it, and then we can take on some of this discourse. And right. some would say that um, the president is also fast. And some have argued, especially from the opposition camp, that the president is fast losing his... Um, his title of crusader for social change mm -hmm. in Nigeria. That's mm -hmm. another issue I'll take your <laughs> thoughts on. Uh, like I said, I mean, this is an ongoing yeah. conversation that will build up to May 29, and we will be bringing you into the studio from time to time yeah, to take on these issues. It's uh, a me, Akin Suju, development mm -hmm. economist and public policy analyst, I would like to thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me. This episode of the program to join us same time next week for more on Insight. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. We'll see you next week. Be your brother's keeper. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>